is every musical word because of, of the space. You know, it's just you know just going, 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 going. There's no breath. You know, I, I think a, a good soloist kind of approaches it like a good singer. The singer has to take breath once in a while, and that's a wonderful spot for a space. And uh, you know, you don't have to take a breath. You can just keep playing every note. Just blah 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 blah. After a while. I hear a lot of that, you know, in me sometimes. <laughs> so. Well, I, I would point out, uh, picking up on, on David's uh, excellent intro, that the way this class came about was um, we were each going to do, we were each going to teach a class about soul. And then it was discovered, a few things were discovered. One was our space uh, limitations with our new location here this year. And then um, also we discovered that our, our the approaches to soloing that we were going to feature in the class were distinctly different. So then got, we got the idea, why not put them together and kind of discuss two different angles for how you can build your own soul. Uh, David's uh, uh, original topic was going to be working with the melody. And from where I come from in... in uh, I'm trying to play jazz tunes a lot, but I also apply the same thought process to bluegrass, and that's probably why I sound kind of goofy and wrong most of the time. <laughs> in jazz music, if you if you're improvising or playing a solo, you're actually not supposed to play the melody, but rather play another melody. Okay, and it's that same kind of fine area that David was talking about. Where's the where's the feeling? Where's the space? What is a melody? If you're just playing a bunch of hot rod licks, is that a melody? Well, not exactly. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the rules that I, or not rules, but one of the things that I tend to say a lot to my students. So when it's your time to blow a solo, um, as the jazz guys say, you, you really don't want to play the melody, but rather another melody. And that other melody is what you're going to create yourself. And the way we go about that is to, to look at the chord structures and uh, scales and chords and what tones are we drawing our ideas from. So as you can see, there were, it started off as kind of two different topic areas and uh, we want to touch on uh, on both a little bit. Yeah. And, and by being able to compare and contrast the, those two two approaches, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to um, put some extra juice into your own solos and, and see if it can take it into Absolutely. You know, in bluegrass, it, the, the bar, like I say, the bar is set real high right now and everybody's playing. It's almost more like bluegrass jazz because they're playing alternate melodies and not playing so much of the melody. But boy, I tell you what, uh, you got to pick and choose those spots. And sometimes just the melody is just the right thing. Exactly. And bluegrass especially. It's just, you know... Uh, Especially kickoffs, uh, you know, if you walk up in the middle of somebody's solo and you don't know what song they're playing, right. you know, is it pleasing, is it something, that, you know, the old timers say, well, I couldn't whistle that. Yeah, <laughs> so. can't remember. <laughs> well, see, now, that, that's it. the same thing with jazz. That, that's the, what I'm talking about is if you play another melody, does it sound melodic as opposed to just a group of hot rod licks? Jethro had that same rule. He says, uh, he used to say, I want to have, no matter what I'm doing on stage, at any point, if it's the fourth solo or the fifth solo in the tune, he says, no matter what is happening, I would like it to be so that if somebody just walked into the club at that moment, they would be able to tell what song I was playing. You so he'll be improvising, you know, using chord tones and improvising, but, you know, you, you'll hear whatever melody line he's playing and you say, Oh, there's Jethro playing Satin Doll. You know, you can recognize it all from single note stuff. The harmonic structure of the tune is illustrated in the whole thing. No, and, no that's all right. It, it keeps referring back to the melody, although it might not be melodically. It might be phrasing wise. Right. The phrasing's there. So, you know, I think that if you keep those things in mind, where it's 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 a suggested melody rather than you know a note for note melody kind of thing. So and that, that's what I hear in great jazz players, you know. It's a, it's it was Les Paul's 
his later approach, because he earlier on he was playing Django. Right. You know, he was like Chet Atkins. Those guys were the, the Django school. They, yeah. they discovered that, and that's, you know, they were doing, you know, they were doing all the places. And the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So, uh, but Les Paul, if you've ever seen his uh, a little uh, documentary about his, his life, he talks later on about just playing the melody. Because he played with... Uh, he had a cut session with Charlie Parker. Oh, did he? And, um, or Charlie Christian. Oh, okay. And Charlie Christian just killed him because he was playing electric guitar. He was playing these big, long, like alto sax notes, these big, long sustain notes. Uh, you know, it just blew him away. And here he's, he's working himself to death, and Christian's over there playing three notes and killing him. That's, it was kind of my dad's approach, too. My dad could play, he could play one note and kill you with it. And you're going, oh, man, this this guy is killing me with one note. And BB King. So sometimes less is certainly more. And, uh, you know, when it comes to well, the, if, you, if you had a melody like a, uh, like a bluegrass melody, then what might you do with it? 